Hello planters, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist with a plant science minor. And on this channel, I like to take that science and I like to apply it to all things plants. So if you like the sounds up, be sure to hit that subscribe button down below and join our group of fellow scientists. I post Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at exactly one o'clock central on all three of those days. I am here for you. I love your questions. And remember, there's no such thing as a stupid one. Let me know what zone you are in because it helps me curate my videos to my audience. And yes, it matters for indoor plants as well. Today, we're gonna be talking about moss poles. And before we even start, I actually, at the end of the video, I'm going to share one crop plant, outdoor crop plant, that I want to try a moss pole with next year. Because the science would indicate that it's a good idea for both disease control, support, and potentially higher yields. If you've been here long enough, I'm pretty sure you could guess what plant I'm going to choose because you've seen my yard and you know what I plant in containers and what I plant in garden spaces. So don't cheat, but let me know in the comments below what crop you think I'm going to talk about or that I'm going to release at the end of this video. Don't cheat and let's see who's right. So in order to talk about moss poles from a science perspective, we need to talk about some main things first. We need to compare it between a wooden stake and a moss pole, what the difference is and why you may want to choose a wooden stake over a moss pole. And then more of the plant science of epiphytes or aeroid plants and why they're specifically geared towards moss poles and why it's better. As the thumbnail suggests the different types of moss poles and which one you may want to choose for your plant because there are different versions and each one does its own thing. So regular stakes, what's the difference between the two? Well, besides the fact that there's moss on the outside of one, a stake is best for crops. And the reason for that is because crops have some very unique structures to them that tropical plants do not have. Um, in the case of tomatoes or even you know squash, pumpkin, cucumbers the outer wax of the stem is usually kind of malleable and soft and i know you know what i'm talking about because if you've ever held those compared to um, apophos or monstera for example you're going to note the difference there's more of a give more of a squoosh to the crop plants and that's what makes them so good at climbing just a wooden stake without anything on it they don't have kind of a solid waxy shiny surface they have um, more of a malleable with tiny little hairs we know what those are called they're called trichomes and all those different anatomies help attach to the plant the other really unique feature that a lot of crops have is that makes them so good at going up trellises or stakes again without any kind of texture to them is actually the tendrils that come off so you know the boingy boingies on <laughs> cucumbers and pumpkins well, those obviously help them kind of crawl up as well on those tendrils again there is more trichomes and more hairs that help kind of grab onto a not so textured surface so that's what makes stakes you know slightly different than moss poles and i've done stakes for years i've done them with my you can see my adansonia behind me you can see my monster on this side they've always been on stakes um but you do notice some odd things happening when you use them for example the tropicals aren't as good at making that quick of a turn on the stake to just one stake in the middle. You'll find, especially with uh, Monsteras, I find in particular, pothos aren't as bad, but they're not able to make that corner. They're not able to angle their cells quick enough to be able to crawl up it. I've also noticed that I need to, in a lot of cases, uh, throw nails in. And I, I cushion the nails, of course. I can show you uh, some footage of that but I do put nails in my bamboo stakes with a monstera because it, I need something for that thick rhizome stem to sit on um, in order to support the size of that plant. So that is some things that I notice with just the bamboo stakes. In a lot of cases, if it's not able to make the corner and I'm noticing it's not making the corner, I'll actually do two bamboo stakes. So I'll put like, you know, one here, one here, just to make it a bit thicker and then I'll kind of train them to go around the two but eventually as you can imagine they will collapse together because the monster just keeps on restricting it and restricting it and it is such a large plant so 
the plant science behind it. So we know that in a lot of cases, when it comes to the moss pole, it's going to apply to mostly epiphytes, aeroids, that sort of thing. Um, of course, you can put things like, like orchids. It doesn't have to necessarily be a vine. It doesn't have to be an anthurium or a monster or a pothos. It could be, you know, it could be just an orchid, for example. It could be an air plant that you're utilizing the moss pole for. But all of them generally use very, except for the air plants, um, all of them have very similar plant science behind why the moss pole works so well. So vines naturally in the rainforest aren't meant to hang, obviously. So we know this because the roots of a pothos monstera, they start in the dirt. They don't start in the canopy of the tree. They start in the dirt and they work their way up to the canopy. The goal is the top of the canopy eventually. So in order to make that happen, they utilize the bark of the tree. We know that bark is textured in a lot of cases and that textured bark combined with lichen and moss growing on the outside of it serves as the perfect place for aeroids um, and epiphyte, epiphytic plants to survive on. So what will happen is those air roots or the rhizome, actually the vine of the plant, will wedge itself in the bark in a fashion that they feel is secure and they'll move up farther and farther. A plant will stunt its growth if it doesn't feel supported or there's a risk of the root um, or a risk of the stem snapping. It will not produce larger leaves, it will not produce a thicker stem. What it will do is it will dwindle down, it will try to make the leaves as small as possible in hopes of getting to the canopy eventually um, or being able to fall off and then retry it and crawl back up again. The lichen and the moss obviously serve as a place for micronutrients, um, but there's some unique features about those aerial roots in a lot of epiphyte and aeroid plants, and there's actually quite a few studies that have been done on them. The studies for the most part show that there's some unique features within those roots that actually allow it not only to catch moisture, not only to secure it to the bark of a tree, but actually capture nutrients on the run as it's coming down the tree from a rainfall. And as a person who is a scientist that loves plants, loves soil, loves nutrients, I find this so, so interesting. And so I was going through some studies um, about this whole concept. And there's one man who honestly, he just puts it in words that are just fantastic. So this is a Zoltz and Winkler study that was done in 2013. And I'm just going to read to you exactly what he has to say about epiphytic roots. This is in refer reference to the roots itself and um, some of the unique structures on the epiphytic roots that make them so good at uh, doing this job. And use some of the discussions I've had with you guys about, you know, soil science and kind of the cation exchange capacity, the CEC of the soil and mobilization of nutrients and particular focus on pH and how it affects, you know, nutrient uptake, all that stuff. This is all, you know, folding into one thing, but this plant, these plants are so miraculous. They're able to do this on the fly without the cation exchange capacity of the soil. So I'm just gonna read it. And then if you get it, you get it. If you don't, we'll have a discussion in the comments. The Zelenum radicum, a spongy, usually a multiple epidermis of the root, which at maturity consists of dead cells, is frequently described as an important adaptation to epiphytic plants. We tested the notion originally put forward by Wendt in 1940 that the velamen allows the plants to capture and immobilize the solutions arriving after a rainfall, which are the most heavily charged with nutrients. First, we show that the velamen of a number of different orchid species takes up solutions within seconds while evaporation from the vamen takes several hours. Charged ions are retained in the velamen, probably due to a positive and negative charge in the cell wall, while uncharged compounds are lost to the external medium. Finally, we demonstrate that the nutrient uptake follows biphasic kinetics, which is heavily efficient in active transportation systems at low external concentrations. 
Thus, our results lead lend strong support to Wendt's hypothesis. The velamen fulfills an important function in nutrient uptake in an epiphytic habitat. So essentially what it's saying is that the outside of an epiphytic root has multiple layers of dead cells, but these dead cells aren't sloughed off and they're actually captured and kept by the plant because it is able to catch the rain as it's coming down and especially anything that is charged negatively, which we know a lot of nutrients are charged negatively, to a positively charged root, which is the velamen, which is the outside of that root, and then it's uptaken by the, the plant. The part I find so interesting is the comment where he says, in seconds. That is crazy. So, I mean, to me, this is just a miracle plant. This is mother nature at its finest. Um, so it's pretty unbelievable. So when you take that in mind, I mean, yeah, a moss pole and epiphytes, it makes sense. So what makes a moss pole the best pole? What, what is the best moss pole? And it's going to consist of some things. And we know that from the plant science side um, and just from, you know, being plant parents ourselves, we know it has to be sturdy. If it's not sturdy, we end up with, you know, weak leaves. And I actually have that happening with my Adansonii. I have them on just a single bamboo stake. It is not sturdy enough and it is causing a disruption in the size of the leaves I'm getting. I went from Adansonia leaves that were this big to Adansonia leaves that are this big. So, and I'm going to show you guys some footage of exactly what that looks like. So that is uh, definitely one I'm having issues with right now. Other thing that we're looking for is texture. So we want some sort of texture to pull. Um, there's different options for this. Uh, you could use juke, you could use chicken wire, you could use just moss. But remember that sturdy part we were talking about? The heavier the plant, the more I encourage you to step back in a way from the moss pole design and maybe go for just a pole design with a juke string on it. Um, juke will hold moisture to a point, but I'd encourage a juke style um, for something like a Monstera Deliciosa. If you put moss with chicken wire on there, depending on how you know handy you are or the quality of the pole, you're gonna notice that it may, it may, uh, tend to fall down uh, and it might rip it down because uh, monstera roots are wild like they are wild roots um, and especially with the deliciosa so we you need to have some, the proper support there and the moss pole may not be the best solution for this but a pole in some capacity is and my next video I'm actually gonna repot this guy my Amazonia, and then I have a raffidophora that needs to be done too and I'm going to show you how I'm going to install these moss poles. So be sure to watch that next video as well. And I'm going to show you all the different designs I use and how I choose them. And then a bonus, but not necessarily something we absolutely need is kind of that moss feature, which is our water feature um, that provides that uh, higher humidity. Now that's going to make your leaves prettier. It's going to make them shinier. It's going to make them have, you know, more venestrations on them in a lot of cases. So not as important, but it's definitely something that you may want to include. And in my moss pools that I make, I just use a uh, peat layer, so the outside peat mat, but then I actually put kitchen sponges inside, um, and that is going to hold moisture a lot longer than sphagnum moss actually is going to. Um, and I have, my fenestrations are just fine on my plants, so um, that's definitely something to consider. I do not use, or I'm not going to be using when I repot this one, any moss at all. I'm going to be using actually a fence post um, with some unique structures on it to help support this big bad boy because I want to aim for monster leaves on this. Um, I've had him for years. I just cut him back this spring and I feel bad about it. Um, but from the footage you've seen, it makes sense. You're gonna see some oddly shaped vines and that just has to do with me incorrectly staking him for literally seven years now. 
Um, so I want to get some monster leaves off of him um, and so I need to give him the proper support to make that happen. For the Raphidophora, I um, don't have, I mean, it's not as necessary for me to have as high moisture as I do with the Adansonii. So with the Raphidophora, I'm going to be doing a juke with just a, a steak on it. Um, the juke is going to add, you know, some moisture to it, but my main objective is giving that uh, Raphidophora more texture to grab onto because um, I think that's more so the important part when it comes to that plant. And then for the Anzonia, I'm going to be doing the peat mat with the sponges in it um, because they do like higher moisture ambiently um, and I want to try to get as much Swiss cheese look as I possibly can off of him. That is the goal. So I hope this helped you choose what you need. Um, I think the important things you need to look for in summary when you're looking for a moss pole is the thickness of the pole, how big it is. Um, if you're noticing that the plant isn't able to spiral that fast or it's not able to curve around quick enough, um, you may need to get a thicker pole. Don't try to force it. You will snap stuff. I can promise you that. Um, so thickness, but also the actual structure and the stability of that structure. So you want it to be very strong and secure in what it's doing. Um, that is probably that is probably the most key to getting the big leaves is the actual structure itself. You want it to be stable. If the plant doesn't feel stable or it feels nervous about climbing, it's not going to climb. So you want to make sure you have that stability. And then moisture is probably your last most important um, feature on the actual moss pole itself. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. If you've been around here long enough, get, be sure to give it a thumbs up and check out my next video so you can actually see um, how I go about installing them for three very unique different plants with um, some very different unique needs. I want to thank you guys so much for watching and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.